Welcome to the show. It's always a pleasure to have you with us as we focus on matters concerning Africa. On the show this week, we host an incredible young African making a huge difference in the agricultural sector through data and research. We get your views on the issues and we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Judy Gishuro. On the show this week, we host Sarah Menka. She's the founder and CEO of Nairobi and New York-based Grow Intelligence. Grow Intelligence cultivates opportunities. It gathers, aggregates, and processes data to unlock crucial insights into weather patterns, trade flows, pricing dynamics, and production, providing users with actionable agricultural data to drive higher productivity and greater access to capital. Prior to founding Grow in 2012, Sarah was a vice president in Morgan Stanley's Commodities Group in New York. She's a trustee of the Mandela Institute for Development Studies, a member of the Global Agenda Council on Africa at the World Economic Forum, and an advisory board member of Shining Hope for Communities, Shofco. Sarah was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum and is a fellow of the Africa Leadership Initiative of the Aspen Institute. She's an Ethiopian national, yet today she says she lives in Plains while calling Nairobi and New York home. Let's get her insights into Africa. Sarah, it's great to have you on the Africa Leadership Dialogues. A young African woman, African educated, I think you went abroad for university. What you've accomplished over the past decade or so is pretty incredible. Looking at your profile, somebody would look and ask, how do you do this over 10 years? How do you achieve so much and even go on to birth your own personal dream? So my question for you, perhaps, the first question that I have today is, what do you think it is that has propelled you to where you are today? So I think it's um, a series of steps at different points in life. I think earlier on when it was kind of moving from high school, getting a scholarship to go to university, it was just hard work. It was, you know, constant studying. It was just, I was, you know, beyond a geek in many ways. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> and the same way, it's, I think, same applied in university. So I was that's just so constantly working hard. So the message there for people who are in school or university is do the work, focus. Yeah, I don't yeah. think anything is a good substitute for hard work um, in any way, in whatever environment or anything. And I think that applies for a career as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, you know, after, right after leaving university, I ended up on Wall Street and I was a commodities trader and I became a commodities trader at Morgan Stanley. And that, you know, I think it's a combination of hard work and also, you know, a combination of being prepared to, you know, for good luck. <laughs> when luck, when luck comes your way, being prepared to take things on. So it's, you know, when something interesting comes on jumping in front of everyone and saying, hey, can I look at this? Can I do this? So, what, I, does that, so, so what does that mean, being prepared for good luck? How, how do you prepare for luck? How do you prepare for it? Um, I think it's two things. One is the hard work, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you're aware. Mm -hmm. um, the second is not being too... It's important to have focus when you're working, but it's also important to be really, I think, open-minded and broaden your thinking. Yeah. So going beyond like your field of expertise and being open to other ideas, because I think those ideas help you connect dots that sometimes people aren't connecting. Right. So it's, it's an openness. To me, that's always been, I've always surrounded myself with people that represent very different fields, very different cultures. You know, they never look like me or do what I do, which meant that I constantly learned from those around me, which meant that when opportunities presented themselves, I probably jumped on them a little faster when people didn't understand. Right, right. They were looking at you like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were skeptical and you said there's something here. Yeah. So you resigned from your job at uh, Morgan Stanley and 
you had a dream. We'll talk a little bit more about the company Grow Intelligence and what you're doing with it. Um, but you, you came to Africa, you came back here. What was it that drove you back home? One is, even when I first left, um, you know, for, for university, I always left thinking and assuming that I would do something back home someday. Mm-hmm. And, but to me, I, at that point in time, even in my life, home was not just Ethiopia. It was actually Africa. So as long as I made it back to the continent somehow, I was going to be and feel okay. So I had to do it. And so even in my studies, even though I did technical things like economics and mathematics, I always did African studies. And it was just this thing that kept me connected. Um, And as a commodities trader, obviously, I had acquired this really rare and weird skill set in some ways that very few people in the world have and very few people have as a job. I was trading energy at the time and energy options, which is even kind of a step more obscure. Um, But I'd acquired this skill set that could be applied to African markets. And I'd grown obsessed about agriculture starting about 2008. So I was trading energy, and I was still trading energy then, But by then, I had really started to be fascinated about agriculture, Mm -hmm. agricultural markets, and looking at Africa as a place because it seemed like the one place in the world with so much potential, we have the cheapest land, but why wasn't it flourishing? And so I started looking at investing. And then every time I looked at investment, I hated it. And I was like, but why do I hate it? Because I don't fundamentally hate agriculture as a business. I don't think it's a bad business. Um, And then eventually I took a step back and and I said, you know, how do I make my decisions today for the job that I do? And it was all driven by, you know, tons and tons of information and data that I collected daily, that I had access to, that I used to make the decisions that I made. Because then you can make projections, you can... Yeah, and you have an understanding, right? It's like, right. So you, if you know what every molecule of gas across a pipeline across the U.S. is doing every single day, that means you know how much of it there is, you know who's buying it, who's selling it, what it's worth. Mm-hmm. In Africa, we don't know what anything is worth because we don't have good data. We don't have standards for the way which we collect it. We don't have a common language we use around it. And so we've kind of been gambling. Um, and so that obsession quickly kind of had to turn into something. And so I decided to just quit my job and, and, and choose an African country. And, and Kenya won in that battle. Why? Why <laughs> Kenya? Why Kenya? Uh, so it was, I mean, you know, when you're kind of packing and moving and you're on your own, there's a couple of things you want. Um, one is flexibility. Mm-hmm. The other is I wanted a country with good tech infrastructure, and Kenya had a reputation for that and had it. And the second, it has open capital markets. So when you're a small startup, you know, having the battles of currency convertibility or bad tech infrastructure, all those things just become too costly and too expensive. So it just became a natural choice. So Sarah, you made a decision, you came back, and you made a move from energy to agriculture. What has the reception been? Um, Tell us about Grow Intelligence, what you do, and the reception to your product and service. Okay, so Grow Intelligence is is basically a a software and a data company. It's a technology company. Um, Those are kind of the three things we live by. It's data, technology, software. It's focused on agriculture. But it's focused on taking really large and disparate data sets that have any link to agriculture or food and making sense of them for the average consumer, the average person, but also the policymaker and the food companies. And so it's what I discovered when I said we have no data in Africa, it's that we basically had lots of data that was collected about us by others, as well as data we'd collected ourselves as countries, as governments and organizations, but everybody does it in their own way, collects it in their own format, stores it in whatever way they want, and none of it speaks to one another. So there isn't a common language around mm-hmm. it. And so what we created is a software that allows us to do that. So we can take data sets that exist in any format, and we normalize it into one language we've created. So if a person just wants to understand what are production cycles and trends in this crop, so say coffee have been in all the different African countries, what are they? How have prices moved? 
what are trading patterns, who are the biggest countries we trade with. So really simple questions, but to answer them today mm -hmm. takes, you know, going to like 15 different websites, trying to combine them on Excel, sometimes they don't fit in Excel, and then you add things like weather and satellite images, which are impossible to an analyze in an Excel, and impossible to analyze if you're not an expert in it. Right. And so we're just kind of distilling that science into consumable format. How do you then send out that information to consumers? So we build products. Um, the, the, the first, our kind of core product is really a data platform. It's a subscription-based, web-based platform that people kind of get a username and password to. Mm -hmm. And then you can visualize all these data sets. So today, we cover all of Africa. We cover over 4 million indicators in different data, data series um, that can be visualized in over 12 million ways. In a couple of months, that number will be north of 20 million. Um, and it's, you know, it's basically, it's really, there's a lot of information mm -hmm. out there. So it's helping people discover it in the way they want to. So you can curate your own stories and your own visuals in a kind of a beautiful way too. So aesthetics right. matter as much. The second is um, we have started to basically distribute a series of newsletters that we send out every Friday. People sign up for free on our website. And the idea there is how can we make people aware of interesting topics in the agricultural sector that you're not thinking about? Because agriculture links to our lives every day beyond just food. Mm -hmm. It links to us through beauty products. It links to us through the you know, drinks. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done things on wine. We've done things on oils. We've um, done pieces on dairy. Mm -hmm. and, but it's all connected. And so that's what we try and help people do is connect the dots and kind of, you know, Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. It's a fascinating service for the continent, finally being able to put together information that was completely disconnected previously and to use it to make clear decisions about, you know, look at the trends and the patterns, strategize, you know. My next question is very simple. What's the uptake in Africa, across Africa, for this product? So that's the part where I say we haven't succeeded yet. <laughs> and can you, can you believe it? <laughs> and part of it is, is because um, the uptake, if we just look at kind of the uptake of our content and who's using it, over 60% actually comes from the US, then it's from Europe, then it's Africa. So the users of your data, the majority are outside the continent. Correct. Making decisions based on your information on Africa, while we are simply not, well, 40%. Well, okay, yeah. let, me, let me not be too pessimistic. But the 40% includes Europe, Asia, South America, and Africa, right? So it's not the 40%. So 60% is the US. Yeah. That's a strong indicator of where the investment or interested investors are coming from for, for agriculture, is it? Correct. And the U.S. has dominated agricultural markets globally for a long time, right? Okay. So you have players like Brazil and Russia in particular crops that compete with, with the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the EU for, you know, other types of crops, but really oftentimes really specialized ones. Uh, but for the mass markets around corn and wheat and soy, the U.S. has dominated. So how do we change? What's the problem, Sarah? Uh, we, Africans are, we are highly intelligent people. We are highly capable. Why are we not focusing on, is, is it lack of focus? I think I always say our biggest challenge um, is really, see, we're not building something that we're trying to displace other products, right, from. So we're not going to customers and we're not going to governments, we're not going to seed companies, fertilizer companies, trading houses, and telling them, get rid of this product and use us instead because we're better. Mm -hmm. We're actually saying, here's something you need that you know you don't even know you need yet. And you can't afford internally to, to, to have this kind of research and, and information, <laughs> so subscribe. And, and, and when you do, it still takes a long time. So even, and, and the commercial side of, commercial businesses, international businesses get it within minutes mm -hmm. because they have big research groups dedicated to collecting information like this. And it takes them a couple of weeks to answer a basic question you can answer in one or two minutes, which is what we do. But our governments haven't been programmed and built to think scientifically and to think by using numbers and making decisions based really rational and measured decisions that almost mimic markets. To me, I, th I think we disconnect policymaking from markets and that's a very dangerous thing. That's a very powerful point. 
how do we start to change that? And and let me ask this as well. Is there has food in Africa been politicized too much or is it just that we're used to its status quo and we don't want to think dif- we don't want to be challenged to think differently? Um It's a difficult question. I think it, it is politicized, but I think food is the agriculture is politicized anywhere in the okay. world. It's a contentious topic anywhere you go in the world. Um, I think we haven't commercialized it here. Right. We haven't viewed it commercially. And so as a result, it's just a different mindset that comes with commercial thinking versus development thinking. And it's not that they're disconnected completely, but mm-hmm. the notion of thinking of food as a, a as development is different from food as commercial. And I think that simple shift and it's a mental and mind shift can actually lead to massive changes. A lot of African leaders do watch this show. What's your message to them right now? And and then leaders in the, in the government space in the private sector in in, yeah. in development as well. What what would you say to them? I mean I would I would say we just need to take much, a much more scientific approach to agriculture and food and by scientific I mean a numbers driven approach um and you know when you're a policy maker in in Kenya and you you know maize is a huge you know kind of market and it, it it's the day to day you know lifeline of of most people 80% of the population it's your job not just to understand maize in Kenya but it's your job to understand how that interacts with maize markets in Zambia and South Africa in the US and how pricing interactions behave because you have to plan policy based off a global market and not your localized view mm. so we have to move to that globalized view though you have to take a scientific approach you it's not gut it's just facts and so we should adopt facts and and the rest of the world is doing it you're going global as a company yes this is happening in 2050 yes <laughs> so that's a pretty big kind of shift in mm-hmm. the sense that we started building as an africa focused product and we built our prototype on africa mm-hmm. and what we discovered is we were showing it to people was actually people wanted this for other parts of the world mm-hmm. so we will be global um by 2015 as a company we're already global because we're now co-headquartered between nairobi and new york um and so there's many things we're doing which is not typical of african startups but it's kind of fun how exciting and congratulations Thanks. uh back to you and your connection to the continent now what excites you most about africa and what upsets you most about africa um i think they're tied <laughs> in the sense that the thing that excites me is all this untapped opportunity so whether it's in agriculture or in energy or in manufacturing or in power i mean you know every sector that we view as 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 um struggling is also an opportunity but i think what f- frustrates me is that that mind shift into looking at it as an opportunity also means giving up certain resources that have supported our governments for a long time with mm-hmm. lots of strings attached and converting you know and kind of going for the harder um the harder thing the harder choice and the harder choice means that in the short run you make sacrifices right. and sacrifices are a hard thing to justify when you have elections or you know whatever it is and so i think that that struggle and that balancing act is is the most difficult but it's the one continent on earth with you know if you if you tick the box on any kind of potential industry mm-hmm. it's the one that's the fastest growing it's the one everyone's looking at and so it's really exciting but it i think it's up to us to make it on our terms are you proud of being an african absolutely yeah. um and i think i am because i was raised that way too i, I think i was it's part of what's always motivated and driven me is that i come i have an identity and i was raised with that strong african identity and so i'm always proud of it but pride also means that you have to be bold enough to try and change the status wow. quo so there a lot of people who are cynical and say we can't because this is africa and we are african and 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 in many ways you know that almost hinders the ability to to be or to make the change what what would your message be Yeah I actually agree with that um statement because for me it's the minute you believe something is not possible then it's not mm-hmm. um you know I 
you know, related to starting a company, which is I had no idea what it would take to start one. I'd never done it before. I never knew what it would take, uh, how, what path I would take, what the product would be. So it's all this, there's all these risks. There's a certain naivete that comes with, I can do it. There's a problem. I care about it. I can do it. And then everything else comes along and you deal with it because you care enough. So I think caring enough is the thing that matters the most. Because we can't do it because we're African. Is, are we genetically wired differently? No. Mm. So, I, I, you know, I, I challenge that. So caring enough and using that care, uh, you know, taking that energy and using it positively rather than wallowing in the, in the pain of it all. Because th there are challenges and, and some Absolutely. people, you know, feel hopeless in the midst of it all. Your story is amazing. I, we could probably do part two, part three with Sarah and go on no. talking about many things because, of course, you, you're also part of the Mandela Institute of Development Studies. There's lots of stuff that you do. Um, I, I want you now to give a message to the continent. We're already at the end of the interview. Please look into the camera. And to Africans who want to make a difference. You know, you've given us a lot of advice as to how we can get there. Um, what final words of encouragement would you have? And to leaders as well, who we really need to set the pace for us. What would your message for them be? It's our, you know, it's, it's our responsibility um, as Africans. It's our responsibility to, to define what's important. And then it's our responsibility to define the parameters in which the game is played. And people will come and play the game with us. But I think until we take that responsibility and shift things to being on our terms, then it becomes really difficult. So to me, it's, it's let's all kind of decide what's important to us. Let's decide the terms of the game and let's invite players in. So, and that applies across the I board. Think, yeah, I think it applies in politics and business and, and education, whatever. Thank you, Sarah, and all the best as you grow this incredible company, Grow Intelligence. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Sarah Benker. I'm the founder and CEO of Grow Intelligence, and you're watching African Leadership Dialogues. What an inspirational Africa and making a change across the continent and particularly exciting that Grow Intelligence founded by this Ethiopian national is now going to be a global company providing information, data, research right across the globe. But the question is, will Africa use more of this information? I certainly hope so. Right now, let's get to your views on the issues. This week, we asked you how can we effectively market, promote, and package agriculture to attract the youth? Steven says, Mindset change. Governments must review policies and laws to prioritize the sector and return it to the curriculum and make it profitable. My name is Martin Jiguna. I'm from Kiambu County. Basically, as for me, I think the education system is what is lacking when it comes to agriculture business. The students and the youth, they should be taught from a very tender age that agriculture, just like any other career, is a tender, uh, is, a, is a lucrative business. And the technology nowadays should only come to boost that, that uh, what they have been told from a tender age. So basically for me, education should, should bring all that together so that the, the youth, they can be able to embrace and take it as a career that can take them further. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues, on Twitter, at Africa LD, and on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. Time now for Africa's top 10. This week on Africa's Top 10, we feature countries with the best agricultural policy costs. The study focused on how one would assess the agricultural policy in relation to the economy. It is ranked on a scale of 1 to 7, 1 being excessively burdensome for the economy and 7 being it balances well the interests of taxpayers, consumers and producers. This is according to the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report 2014-2015. Starting us off at number 10 is Kenya. With an index of 4.04, the East African country is ranked 50th globally. 
Coming in at number 9 is Botswana with an index of 4.07. The South African country is ranked 48th globally. At number 8 is Ethiopia with an index of 4.1 and is ranked 42nd globally. Taking the number 7 spot is Zambia with an index of 4.19 and is ranked 35th globally. Slotted in at number 6 is the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire with an index of 4.23. The West African nation is ranked at position 32 globally. At number 5 is Nigeria with an index of 4.26 and is ranked 30th globally. Positioned at number 4 is the island nation of Mauritius with an index of 4.3 and is ranked 26th globally. At number 3 is Rwanda with an index of 4.52 and is ranked at number 18 globally. Coming in at number 2 is Morocco with an index of 4.57. The North African country is ranked 15th globally. And at number 1 this week is the Gambia with an index of 4.8. The West African state is ranked 5th globally. And that's Africa's top 10 this week. As always, we end with an African proverb. Here we go. The sun does not forget a village just because it is small. Think about it. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.